Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lectures. My name is Eileen Burke, and I'm the coordinator of these lectures. Our videotaping today is sponsored by the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Our speaker today is Andrew Jewell. Andy is an associate professor in the University Libraries here at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and editor of the Willa, Willa Cather Archive. Andy has published several essays on Willa Cather and other American writers, scholarly editing, and digital humanities. He is co-editor of the books, The American Literature Scholar in the Digital Age, which was done in, in 2011, and The Selected Letters of Willa Cather, which was done in 2013. Since 2008, Andy has also been a member of the Board of Governors of the Willa Cather Foundation. Andy's talk today is, is about editing the letters of Willa Cather. Please join me in welcoming Andy Jewell. Thank you so much and for having me here today, and thanks for the Preservation Association of Lincoln. I am glad to share about a woman who's important to the history of Lincoln and who I hope is well-preserved, um, Willa Cather. Uh, Today I'm going to talk a little bit about my work editing this book um, with my colleague Janice Stout. I want to make sure I point out that this was a co-editing work, and Janice is a good friend of mine who lives in Texas and so can't be here today, but uh, we worked together on this. And I want to share some about the process of making this book and also share with you some of my favorite Cather letters that show her um, throughout her long and interesting life. You know, here in Nebraska, we tend to sometimes think of Cather as only a local girl um, that we talk about because she's from around here and wrote about this place. But it has struck me in my time um, studying Cather that she's really a much bigger figure. She's a really an inter a writer of international importance. Um, anecdotally, this kind of hit home for me when I was um, in Amsterdam last fall and I was chatting with a, a Dutch man there, and he, I mentioned that I worked on Willa Cather, and he said, oh yes, Willa Cather, a translation's just been published here, and it's doing quite well. And I thought, oh, great. Uh, and, you know, and, and not too long after that, um, I was hearing from other translators who were um, sh sending their books, the new translations, uh, to Love Library for our collections. And so Cather um, is someone of, of real importance, and she's celebrated by all sorts of other writers and people around the world. She's been translated into something over 40 languages. Um, and she won in her lifetime almost every major award uh, you can imagine for an, a, a writer. So it's really odd that her letters have just been published. After all, she's been dead now for 66 years. Um, why? were her letters never available before. For someone of her stature, it would have been quite common for the letters to come out quite soon after her death. Well, there's a very good reason for that. She forbid it. She, in her will, she said she did not want her letters published. We don't exactly know why. Um, there is a lot of speculation. Janice and I believe it has to do with Cather's general attitudes about wanting to shape how readers understood her and wanting those readers to understood her, th understand her through what she thought was her best work. Um, the words she toiled over, the novels that she took her time to write. And she didn't want them to read the things she hastily scrawled when she was a teenager. Um, although, you'll see in a moment, those are wonderful too. Um, there's a, she wrote in one letter to, to a gentleman who wanted to edit her early um, short stories that she wrote when she was at college and bring them out. She, she didn't like that idea, and, and she wrote to him uh, this little metaphor, which I think also applies to her attitudes toward her letter. She said, suppose I were an apple grower, and packing my year's crop, I was very careful to put only the apples I thought reasonably sound into the packing boxes, leaving the defective ones in a pile on the ground. While I am asleep or at dinner, a neighbor comes to the orchard and puts all the worthless apples into the boxes that are go to go to market. Would you call that a friendly action or the neighbor a friendly man? Writing is subject to outside conditions, to drought, crow peckings, wasps, hailstorms, just as much as apples are. The honest writer, like the honest fruit grower, sorts his work over and tries to keep only what is fairly sound. Well, rightfully, Cather's wishes about not publishing her letters was observed for many, many decades. Um, but she did foresee, even in her will, that it wouldn't stand forever, that this ban for someone of her stature to the writer of My Antonia and O Pioneers and Death Comes to the Archbishop and A Lost Lady and so many books that uh, continue to be treasured as really important books in American literary history. I think she understood 
um, that, that there would be interest in doing this one day and publishing her letters. And she and have put in her will that she left it to the, quote, sole and uncontrolled discretion of my executors and trustee on what to do about the publication of the letters. Her first two executors, um, uh, her partner Edith Lewis and then her nephew Charles E. Cather, both of whom had relationships with Cather, did follow her wishes quite clearly. Um, but, but Cather knew that, that this might not last forever, and in 2009, uh, things began to change. And the, now, with the death of Charles Cather in 2011, there's a new executor of Cather's estate. It's the Willa Cather Trust. The Willa Cather Trust is a partnership between two educational organizations, the Willa Cather Foundation in Red Cloud, Nebraska, and the University of Nebraska Foundation. And these educational organizations, which have spent many years supporting the scholarship on Cather, knew that scholarship would be better, that, that students, teachers, scholars, readers, everyone would be more informed if these letters were accessible. And they thought the time was right um, to, to bring these letters out. And so that is why now we can publish the letters. You know, I think when, when readers encounter these letters, they're going to get a different sense of Willa Cather than they had before. Um, many people think of her as somewhat distant, somewhat remote, maybe a little grouchy. Uh, and, and I think this emerges from the fact that we don't have her personal voice very easily accessible because of her letters being banned. But when you read these letters, you'll see that a new personality emerges, the real personality of Willa Cather. She's funny, she's vivacious, she's, she can be a little prickly, but also often in a hilarious way, in my opinion, um, but often very affectionate. Um, she maintained relationships with friends uh, from her teenage days to the day she died. And she, had, uh, she was, she was a, often a very warm person. Um, and, and it's wonderful to have these letters emerge so the real personality, the real human qualities of Cather can, can be accessible. Uh, you know, one, one legend that was out there for a long time was that Cather actually collected and burned up all of her letters. Uh, we don't think this is true anymore. Um, one of the pieces of evidence for this is the fact that so many letters now survive. We know of th about 3,000 letters out there that Cather wrote that have survived. If she was seeking to burn them, the, she, at the very least, she did a terrible job of it. Um, <laughs> it, it. What's more likely is that that was not true, that that was a legend that emerged because in her final days, she was a private woman, um, especially in her last decade. There is one instance reported in a memoir of, of one set of letters that she wrote to her dear friend, Isabel McClung Homburg, that were likely burned. And indeed, none of those letters to Isabel have um, shown up if they've survived. But, but a systematic burning, there's no evidence for that anymore, even though most biographies, if you read them, will, will make that claim because it was believed for so long. But one letter that came only recently into the archives of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Libraries um, shed some other light into how those close to her didn't have this notion at all. Um, there was a letter written by Cather's niece about Cather's funeral. And the, the niece wrote to her mother, Cather's sister-in-law, Maida Cather, and she said at the very end of this letter, we must keep all of Aunt Willie's safe, all of Aunt Willie's things safe, safe from fire or something unexpected. Uh, they, her family, who was closest to her, wanted to keep these letters, and indeed those very letters that that niece was talking to were donated um, to the University of Nebraska Lincoln Libraries in one of the most remarkable collections of, of 400 letters that Cather wrote to her brother and his family. Um, in this book, we sought to make a book that honored the wide uh, and diverse group of Cather's readers. We could have made a book that was just kind of a book for scholars that would be placed, uh, would, be, would be very expensive and placed only in libraries. Uh, no one would ever want to buy it. But we really wanted a book that would tell the story of Cather's life through her letters, a book that one reviewer called an epistolary autobiography, uh, an autobiography in letters. So we arranged it. Uh, chronologically, using whole letters, not parts, and filling in some gaps in information and putting uh, kind of the bridge between the letters so you could read through this book and get a sense of Cather's life story in her own words. Um, we picked 566 of the, of the total of the 3,000 letters for this book. It's, it's only 19% of the total, but the ones that we felt um, best expressed Cather's personality, best expressed um, 
the many different relationships and parts of her life, and also her insights into her work and the creative writing process, which so many people are interested in. Um, and so we hope, and we're encouraged by the response to the book, that many people have, people who not, didn't necessarily know a lot about Cather have found it an interesting story to read um, through these letters. And that's frankly what we hoped for, that this would be a story of a fascinating life that you would get through these letters. And I want to share some of the letters with you now. Um, a, a diverse group of letters that deal with different parts of Cather's life, or parts of those letters anyway. And the first one is, is one she wrote just after she moved away from Lincoln. I might um, back up and say Cather, uh, she moved to Nebraska when she was nine years old. Her family is from Virginia. And they went to Red Cloud in south central Nebraska, where she spent her teenage years and graduated from high school. And in 1890, she came to Lincoln. Um, and she was here for five years, first as a prep student and then as a, as a college student at the University of Nebraska. And she graduated in 1895, spent about a year trying to figure out what she wanted to do and unsuccessfully campaigned to be an English teacher in the university, um, and finally got a job in Pittsburgh, thanks to the help of one of her old friends at the Nebraska State Journal. Uh, this job was to edit the magazine called The Home Monthly. And this first letter is about going to Pittsburgh and meeting James Axtell, the man who would be her boss and who, in whose home she would live when she first moved there, um, and, and about her excitement in starting this new job, this really this first job out of college. And this letter is written to Mariel Gear um, of the well-known Gear family of Lincoln. Uh, this is from July of 1896. My dear Mariel, I've been only a few hours in this city of dreadful dirt, so you must not take my first impression seriously. I feel like being funny. I began to feel good as soon as I got east of Chicago. When I got to where there were some hills and clear streams and trees the Lord planted, I didn't need any mint and julep. The conductor saw my look of glee and asked if I was getting back home. Mr. Axtell met me at the station and timidly approached me. I did not think he could be the man at first, and I repulsed him with scorn. But he was exceedingly cordial and brought me right out home. They live in a beautiful part of the city where the hills are all built up with big, ivy-grown houses that are beautiful to see. When we entered the parlor, though, my heart sank. It's one of the hair-cloth furniture kind, and its only ornament was a huge crayon portrait of Grandpa. But the library is much better. It also contains a picture of Grandpa. But there are also novelists of the milder sort, and I saw Mrs. Axtell reading Harper's, which is encouraging. Now the sad news, the Puritan maid, which was the Axtell's daughter, is not at home. She is over in Waynesburg visiting Aunt Somebody and being coached in Greek preparatory to going to Vassar this fall. Well, so they say, but I secretly believe they sent her away to save her from my contaminating influence. I'm rather glad she is not here. It will give me a better chance to get on in my new role. But the room I have must be hers, I think, as it contains three Bibles. Of course, she took three with her, so that makes six. <laughs> Alas, it also contains many a well-worn copy of the trashy religious novels of E.P. Rowe. I can stand the Bibles, but not the E.P. Rowe. Now, here are the joyful tidings. Grandpa is not here. He is down at Mission Ridge with Aunt Somebody and will probably remain there the rest of his natural days. They say the climate suits him, and may it continue to do so. For I feel at the stern eye of Grandpa, so accustomed to detecting the follies and foibles of this world, would penetrate my thin disguise, and he would cry out, I see her, the devotee of French fiction, the consort of musicians and strolling players. Heaven save me from the Argus-eyed Grandpa. Now, when I get a good pen and some new impressions, I will write a letter you can read. For the present, this must, must do. Love to all, and especially to your mama. In haste. Willa. You know, as a side note, uh, Mariel's mother, Mariel Clapham Gear, was her name, is credited with convincing Cather that she needed to learn how to spell. And as somebody who had to transcribe her letters, I thank Mrs. Gear for teaching <laughs> her that. You know, Cather worked in Pittsburgh as a journalist uh, and as a teacher for about a decade uh, in a variety of different roles there. And then she was. Um, whisked away uh, to New York, where she became 
an editor at McClure's Magazine. Now, McClure's Magazine in the day was hugely influential, one of the leading magazines of the day, and it was led by S.S. McClure, quite a whirlwind of a man and often called a genius of journalism. Uh, he managed to make a magazine of, of significant importance, um, but he didn't often stay around. He would would stir things up and then go travel and, and drum up content for the magazine, which left his staff to do a lot of the work. And over the years that Cather was there, she became one of the leaders of that staff, in effect, um, uh, kind of in charge of the magazine. Many people have pointed out that before she ever became a professional novelist, due to her high stature at McClure's Magazine, she was one of the most important women in journalism in the United States. Um, and quite as successful in this first career of hers that not everybody knows about. But the whole time um, she was working at McClure's, she harbored a longing to be a writer, to be a novelist, a poet, a fiction writer of some kind. Uh, and she indeed published some books. Before she left McClure's, she published her first novel, Alexander's Bridge, in 1912. But, but she'd been thinking for quite some time about what she wanted to do and whether the work at McClure's was what she wanted to do. And I want to share uh, a part of a, a long letter that's really, I think, one of the most remarkable letters in the book and most remarkable letters that Cather wrote. It's to a mentor of hers named Sarah Orne Jewett. Um, Jewett was a well-known writer of the day, um, and Cather had met her while working for McClure's and, and doing some research in Boston. And Jewett encouraged Cather in her, her fiction. Um, and then in 1908, December 19th, 1908, um, she wrote this letter to Sarah Orne Jewett. My dear, dear Miss Jewett, such a kind and earnest and friendly letter as you sent me. I have read it over many times. I've been in deep perplexity these last few years, and troubles that concern only one's habit of mind are such personal things that they are hard to talk about. You see, I was not made to have to do with affairs what Mr. McClure calls men and measures. If I get on at that kind of work, it's by going at it with a sort of energy most people have to exert only on rare occasions. Consequently, I live just about as much during the day as a trapeze performer does when he is on the bars. It's catch the right bar at the right minute or into the net you go. I feel all the time so dispossessed and bereft of myself. My mind is off doing trapeze work all day long and only comes back to me when it is dog-tired and wants to creep into my body and sleep. And then reading so much poorly written matter as I have to read has a kind of deadening effect on me somehow. I know that many great and wise people have been able to do that, but I am neither large enough nor wise enough to do it without getting a kind of dread of everything that is made out of words. I feel deluded and weakened by it all the time, relaxed, as if I had lived in a tepid bath until I shrank from either heat or cold. Mr. McClure tells me that he does not think I will ever be able to do much at writing stories, and that I'm a good executive and I'd better let it go at that. I sometimes, indeed I very often, think he is right. If I have been going forward at all in the last five years, it has been progress of the head and not of the hand. At 34, one ought to have some sureness in their pinpoint and some facility in turning out a story. In other matters and things about the office, I can usually do what I set out to do, and I can learn by experience. But when it comes to writing, I'm a newborn baby every time, always come into it naked and shivery and without any bones. I never learn anything about it at all. I, I sometimes wonder whether one can possibly be meant to do the thing at which they're more blind and inept and blundering at than at anything else in the world. But the question of work aside, one has a right to live and reflect and feel a little. When I was teaching, I did. I learned more or less all the time. But now I have the feeling of standing still, except for a certain kind of facility, and getting the sort of material Mr. McClure wants. It's stiff mental exercise, but it's about as much food to live by as the elaborate mental arithmetic would be. Of course, there were interesting people and interesting things in the day's work, but it's all like going around the world in a railway train and never getting off to see anything closer. I don't have a reporter's mind. I can't get things in fleeting glimpses, and I can't get any pleasure out of them. And the excitement of it doesn't stimulate me. It only wears me out. So whether or not the chief is right about my never doing much writing, I think one's immortal soul is to be considered a little. He thrives on this perpetual debauch. But five years more of it will make me a fat, sour, ill-tempered lady, and fussy worst of all, and assertive. 
Now, all people who do feats on the flying trapeze and never think are as, cocky or as, ter as cocky as terriers after rats, you know. Devotedly, Willa. Well, as we all know, Cather did manage to leave McClure's and her first career as a journalist, and like I said, in 1912, published her first novel, which is called Alexander's Bridge. And that book it was set in Boston and London and involved a pretty conventional love triangle and didn't really establish Cather as this brave new voice in American fiction. That would be with her next book, which was O Pioneers, a book we're celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. It's published in 2013. In fact, it's the one book, one Nebraska selection this year. This was about the American West. It was about Nebraska. It was written with a new kind of confidence that Cather found after she left McClure's and after she visited Arizona in 1912. She had a remarkable trip to the Southwest where she really, as she said, got her mind washed and ironed and ready for a new life. And it was a remarkable time. Um, and I want to read a selection, a bits of two little letters from this period when O Pioneers was emerging, um, a really remarkable period where Cather's mature voice started to emerge. And, and you can get a, a, a sense of that process here. The first one is to her good friend Elizabeth Sergeant, or Elsie Sergeant, and she wrote it in April 20th, 1912, from Winslow, Arizona, where she was visiting her brother. My dear Elsie, I've been tramping about the West for two weeks now and have just reached my mail, which was all forwarded to Winslow. The West always paralyzes me a little. When I'm away from it, I remember only the tang on the tongue. But when I come back, I always feel a little of the fright I felt when I was a child. I always feel afraid of losing something. And I don't in the least know what it is. It's real enough to make a tightness in my chest, even now. And when I was little, it was even stronger. I can never entirely let myself go with the current. I always fight it just a little, just as people who can't swim fight it when they're dropped into water. It's partly there, the, the feeling that there are so many miles, just wait till you travel them between you and anything, and partly the fear that the everlasting wind may make you contented and put you to sleep. I used always to be sure that I'd never get out, that I would die in a cornfield. Now I know that I will get out again, but I still get attacks of fright. I wish I didn't. I somehow feel that if one were really a fit person to write about a country, they wouldn't feel that. That was in the spring of 1912. Uh, and then throughout the next several months, she began writing O Pioneers. And by December of 1912, this is actually written on her birthday, December 7th, 1912, she was really going on it. That, that confidence she needed to write about the country she knew is something she found in that time, both in Arizona and also in Nebraska. She spent a lot of time in Red Cloud watching the wheat harvest come in um, and seeing her neighbors and, and being uh, given the confidence to celebrate them in fiction. So here's a letter to the same woman, Elsie Sergeant, in December of 1912, and this one's from Pittsburgh. Dear Elsie, I have nothing but work to talk about as I'm on the home stretch with a new story. It's running about the same length as Alexander, and is certainly a great deal better than The Bohemian Girl, which was a long short story she had published the previous year. It has been rather a pull because it's knit so much closer than anything I have done before. No, I don't think one can write much when one is getting the material. At least I, for one, can't. But you know, but you know I think getting the material coming up against the surfaces of the things is the exhausting part of it. The mere working it off of one's pen on the whole is a peaceful chore. I want to write to you so many things, but Christmas, people, a bloody murder in my story, I've been three mortal days of killing them. All these have reduced me to a state where I can only make a few scratches and wish you well and well and well. Yours, WSC. Well, after the publication of O Pioneers in 1913 and then The Song of the Lark in 1915, Cather wrote the novel that really secured her reputation in American literature, and that's My Antonia, which came out in 1918 and is often the most well-known of Cather's books. It was heralded by critics almost right away as a really remarkable book. Um, and Cather, as many of the letters to her family tell us, liked to share um, all the good reviews and, and good press and good feelings she was getting from the readers. And I have a couple of short parts of letters to share with you about that. The first one was written on Thanksgiving Day in 1918, the year the book came out, uh, November 28th, um, from New York, where she lived most of her adult life, to her brother Roscoe. My dear Roscoe, your nice letter deserved a speedy answer. I'm so glad that you and father and mother like this book. Most of the critics, too, seem to find it the best book that I, I have done. 
I got quite a wonderful letter about it from France today, and it will be published in France very soon. Personally, I like the book before this one better because there is more warmth and struggle in it. She changed her mind on that point, by the way. <laughs> well, all the critics find Antonia more artistic. A man in the nation writes that, quote, it exists in an atmosphere of its own, an atmosphere of pure beauty. Nonsense. It's the atmosphere of my grandmother's kitchen and nothing else. Booth Tarkington writes that it is, quote, simple as a country prayer meeting or a Greek temple and as beautiful. There are lots of these people who can't write anything true themselves, who yet recognize it when they see it. And whatever is really true is true for all people. And as long as people say, will people stand this or that, one gets nowhere. Either have to be utterly commonplace or else do the thing people don't want because it has not yet been invented. No really new and original thing is wanted. People have to learn to like new things. Lovingly, Willie. This next one to her mother was written about a year later after um, she had a year of growing reputation and growing popularity. And she kind of wrote with, um, I think, her tongue in her cheek much of the time in this letter to her mother. Uh, this is December 6, 1919. My dearest mother, in addition to painting the bathroom and doing the housework and trying to write a novel, I have been, be, been becoming rather famous lately, and that is an added care. In other years, when I was living like a lady with an impressive French maid, I could have been famous quite conveniently, but then I had only to receive a few highbrows. And now the man in the street seems to have got on to me, and it's very inconvenient. The enclosed on the editorial page of the Tribune is only one of a dozen articles that have come out in all the New York papers in the last two weeks. People write furious letters to the Sun to ask why their editor has not stated that I am the greatest living American author. The Sun editor replies, give him time, maybe he will say that. I've had nothing to do with this whirlwind of publicity, God knows. My publishers have had nothing to do with it. They're the most astonished people you ever saw. One of them came racing down from Boston to see me, and he kept holding his head and saying, but why should this book, this one, catch on? Anybody would have said it could never be a popular book. You see, they advertised it hardly at all, and I didn't urge them. I thought it was a book for the very few, and now they're quite stunned. A side note, she most certainly did urge them all the time. <laughs> there are a lot of letters where she said, I think the advertising needs to be improved. Um, but this is such an awkward time to be famous. The stage is not set for it. Reporters come running to the house all the time and keep finding me doing housework. They demand new photographs, and I have no new clothes and no time to get any. <coughs> Yesterday, when I was washing dishes at the sink with one of your long gingham aprons tied around my neck, because I've never had time to shorten it, I heard a knock at the front door. I did not stir. Then a knock at the kitchen door. Uh, such a very dapper young man asked me if Miss Cather, the author, lived here, and I hesitated. He said, tell her I'm from the New York Sun, and I want to see her on important business. Well, I told him that Miss Cather had gone to Atlantic City for a rest. You see, I simply couldn't live up to the part. He left saying there was to be a big article about me on Sunday. Well, I've gotten about two-thirds of my book written through for the first time, and next week I begin to write it through from the first again. Some of it will have to be done over four or five or even six times, but there is good life and movement through it. I hope I'll be at home when it comes out, for it was among the greatest, almost the greatest pleasure I ever had to be at home when Antonia came out, and you and father are reading it, both of you at once, and I could see how much you really did enjoy it. Yes, I think that was about the most satisfactory experience I ever had. It made me happy who I used to be when I was a little girl and felt you were both pleased with me. So lovingly, Willie. Well, after the publication of My Antonia, Cather's literary production and subsequently her reputation continued to soar. In 1922, she published one of ours, which won the Pulitzer Prize, and then the rest of the 20s saw a string of masterpieces, A Lost Lady, The Professor's House, My Mortal Enemy, and in 1927, Death Comes for the Archbishop. During these years, she was certainly one of the most well-known writers in the United States, and her works were being translated into many languages around the world. And so, as a famous writer, she was asked repeatedly to, to, do, to, a, number, to do a number of things, to give interviews, to give lectures, to write something occasional. Um, she got so many requests that she quipped once that one of the great ironies of becoming a well-known writer is that then the world conspires to take away your writing time. <laughs> um, she often turned down these requests, but she did honor 
the 60th anniversary of one of the important periodicals of her writing life. In the spring of 1927, she wrote a letter to Will Owen Jones, her old mentor and the editor of Lincoln's Nebraska State Journal, the newspaper that's now the Lincoln Journal Star. Um, and she shared some of her memories of the paper and its old publisher and editor, Charles Gear, the father of her friend, Mariel. This letter, which I'll read just a part of, was actually first published in the Nebraska State Journal in July of 1927. My dear Mr. Jones, certainly I wish to send my congratulations to the journal on its 60th birthday. I have many pleasant memories connected with it, with the journal, I mean, not with its birthday. You see, I still write as badly as ever. But the first time I, was, I ever confronted myself in print was one Sunday morning, and please don't append an editorial note here stating just how many years ago it was, when I opened the Sunday journal and saw, stretching out through a column or two, an essay on some personal characteristics of Thomas Carlyle, which Professor Hunt had given you to publish, quite without my knowledge. That was the beginning of many troubles for me. Up to that time, I had planned to specialize in science. I thought I would like to study medicine, but what youthful vanity can be unaffected by the sight of itself in print? It has a kind of hypnotic effect. I still vaguely remember that essay, and it was a splendid example of the kind of writing I most dislike, very florid and full of high-flown figures of speech, and if I recall aright, not a single personal characteristic of the gentleman was mentioned. I wrote that title at the top of the page because it was the assigned subject and then poured out the best I could the feelings that a fervid reading of the French Revolution and Sartorius Artists had stirred up in me. Come to think of it, that flowery effusion had one merit. It was honest. Florid as it was, it didn't overcolor the pleasure and delightful bitterness that Carlyle can, can arouse in a very young person. It makes one feel so grown up to be bitter. A few years after this, I began to write regularly for the Sunday Journal, you remember, and I was paid a dollar a column, which was certainly quite all my high-stepping rhetoric was worth. Those outpourings were pretty dreadful, but I still indebted to the managing editor at that time, who was Will Owen Jones, the man she was writing to, that he let me step as high as I wished. It was rather hardened on the readers, perhaps, but it was good for me because it enabled me to riot in fine writing until I got to hate it and began slowly to recover. I remember that sometimes a bright twinkle in Mr. Gear's fine eyes used to make me feel a little distrustful of my rhetorical magnificence. He never corrected me. He was much too wise for that. He knew that you can't hurry nature. But I think his kindness, his easy wit, the ease and charm of his personality helped me all the time. I was very fortunate in my first editor. He let me alone, knowing that I must work out my own salvation. And he was himself all that I was not and that I most admired. Isn't it too bad that after we are much older and a little wiser, we cannot go back to those few vivid persons of our early youth and tell them how they've always remained with us, how much pleasure their fine personalities gave us and give us to this very day? But after all, it's a good fortune to have Mr. Gear alive in one's memory, not one but a thousand characteristic pictures of him. And I congratulate the Nebraska State Journal and myself, that we both had such an editor in our early activities. With pleasant memories of the past and good wishes for the future of the Nebraska State Journal, I am most cordially yours, Willa Cather. One of the real pleasures of reading Cather's letters, or anybody's letters, I suppose, is the way they give you glimpses into private moments of vulnerability and beauty and affection and tenderness. And the last three um, parts of letters I wish to share with you are, are wonderful examples of these kinds of moments. Um, the first is written to Cather's longtime friend, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, and Cather wrote, only, wrote it shortly after the death of her father in 1928. She wrote it on April 3rd, 1928, from Red Cloud. My dearest Dorothy, my father died on March 3rd, just seven days after I had left home for New York. He was ill only a few hours, and Gina. He was happy and gay to the very end. I'd like to show you his picture sometime. He kept such an extraordinarily youthful color and young eyes and figure. He was very handsome in a boyish southern way. I have lost people I love terribly, young people, but this is the first death there has ever been in our family, never a child or grandchild. I did not know that death could be so beautiful. I got home to him a little after five, just as the dawn was breaking over him, 
He lay on a little stretcher in the big bay window of his own room in one of his long silk shirts, and all the rest of the tired family were asleep. He looked so happy, so contented, so at home, his smooth, fair face shaved, everything as it always was. He was such a sweet southern boy, and he never hurt anybody's feelings, not even in death. Think of it, my dear, this winter of all winters I had here with my parents, simply because I felt we never could be so happy again. I stayed because they were both so well, not because they were ailing. Having had those three months as by a miracle, I'll stand a good deal of punishment at the hands of fate. Mother went to California with my bachelor brother two weeks ago, and I've been staying on alone to have a lot of papering and repairing done. Such a nice, wise, kind, bohemian paper hanger to do everything. And just silence in the old house and in Father's room has done so much for me. I feel so rested and strong. It's as if Father himself had restored my soul. I suppose after Easter I must go back to the world, but not for long. Lovingly, Willa. One of the really um, special gems in this collection is the one and only letter that we know of to Edith Lewis, the woman that Cather shared a home with for nearly 40 years and who was really influential in Cather's writing. In fact, manuscripts that have come to light in recent years show us that Lewis, who was herself a professional um, copyright, copy editor and um, ad copywriter, uh, was helped polish Cather's prose, helped make suggestions that Cather accepted as editorial and, and was really influential in making Cather's work that we know. Um, they had a very uh, long time together, but only one letter, for reasons we don't know, has survived. And this was a letter written from the Shattuck Inn in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, a, a place they like to go often and near where today Cather is buried. Um, this is from October 5th, 1936. My darling Edith, I'm sitting in your room looking out at the woods you know so well, and so far everything delights me. I'm ashamed of my appetite for food, and as for sleep, I'd forgotten that sleeping can be an active and very strong physical pleasure. It can. It has been for all of three nights. I wake up now and then, saturated with the pleasure of breathing clear mountain air, not cold, just chill air, of being up high with all the woods below me sleeping too in still white moonlight. It's a grand feeling. One hour from now, out of your window, I shall see a sight unparalleled. Jupiter and Venus, both shining in the golden rosy sky and both in the west, she not very far above the horizon, and he about midway between the zenith and the silvery lady planet. From 5.30 to 6.30, they are of a superb splendor, deepening in color every second, and in a still daylight sky, guiltless of other stars. The moon not up, and the sun gone down behind Gap Mountain, those two alone in the whole vault of heaven. It lasts so, about an hour, did last night. And then the lady, so silvery still, slips down into the clear rose-colored glow to be near the departed sun, and imperial Jupiter hangs there alone. He goes down about 8.30. Surely it reminds one of Dante's eternal wheels. I can't but believe that all that majesty and all that beauty, those faded and unfailing appearances and exits, are something more than mathematics and horrible temperatures. If they are not, then we are the only wonderful things because we can wonder. I have worn my white silk suit almost constantly with no white hat, which is very awkward. But by next week, it'll probably be colder. Everything you packed carried wonderfully, not a wrinkle. And now I must dress to receive the planets, dear, as I won't wish to take the time after they appear and they will not wait for anybody. Lovingly, W. I don't know when I have enjoyed Jupiter so much as this summer. I want to end with a passage from a letter that Cather wrote to her brother in 1938 from the same place, the Shattuck Inn in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. This was a difficult period in Cather's life. In 1938, saw the death of her good friend Isabel McClung Homburg, who she had known for um, many years, and also her brother Douglas, who she was quite close to. Um, and those deaths, plus growing illnesses that she had and, and, and problems, physical problems, uh, made it quite a stressful time for her. And you can hear that um, in this letter. This is from November 6, 1938. My dear brother, 
I'm up here alone at this hotel in the woods where I have done most of my best work and where the proprietors are so kind to me. I finished Antonia here, finished A Lost Lady, and began The Archbishop. The best part of all the better books was written here. It was Isabel who first brought me here. You cannot imagine what her death means to me. It came just four months after Douglas's death before I'd got my nerves steady again. No other living person cared as much about my work through 38 years as she did. And as for me, I've cared too much about people and places, cared too hard. It made me as a writer, but it'll break me in the end. I feel as if I couldn't go another step. People say I have a classic style. A few of them know it's the heat under the simple words that count. I early learned that if you loved your theme enough, you could be as mild as a May morning and still make other people care. People in countries who read it in the strangest languages, Hungarian and Romanian are the latest. Someday you must come see my whole bookcase full of translations. But it's the one thing, that simple really caring for an old Margie, who is a reference to Marjorie Anderson, a woman who worked in their home when they were children, for an old Margie, an old cat, an old anything. I never cultivated it. From the age of 20 on, I did all I could to repress it. And that effort of mine did, after years, give me a fairly good style. Style being merely the writer. No, the person himself, what he was born with and what he has done for himself. Isabel watched me every step of the way. But the source of supply seems to be getting low. I work a little every day, one and a half hours, to save my reason, to escape from myself. But the sentences don't come sharp and clear as they used to. The pictures are a little blurred. Perhaps it's fatigue only. I hope so. This book, which is her last novel, Sophia and the Slave Girl, this book has been twice interrupted by death and twice by illness. I keep it up not for the book itself, but for the peace it brings me to follow old activities that used to be so happy, so rapid, and so absolutely absorbing. Well, goodbye, dear. I have not written so long a letter in a long time. W. To me, these letters reveal Cather to be a, a, such a more tender and, and profound and vulnerable and fascinating person than I previously, than I think any of us previously understood. And, and I think they bring to light elements of her rich humanity that really weren't accessible before. And I hope after hearing these few selections, you agree. Thank you very much for your attention. And if anyone has any questions or wants to make any comments, I'm happy to take questions. Yes. So handwriting as you show it? Yes. It looks very difficult to read. Yes. Did, I mean, that must have taken you a long time to learn. <laughs> it, it did. You know, when I first saw it, I first saw it as a graduate student, and I was terrified. You know, it, it, it was, and I, um, I could go back so people can see it. Uh, it is very difficult for people who are unfamiliar with it to read it. Um, thankfully, it gets easier. When you spend time, oh, yeah, you can kind of see it there. When you spend time with the handwriting, before long it, becomes, it begins to look familiar. That said, when Janice and I started working on the book and we wanted to make sure the transcriptions were 100% accurate, we were worried about it because there are there are moments in the letters, there are words that just seem like a smear sometimes. Um, but you know, through going, going through them, the transcriptions again, and, and rechecking them, and, and sometimes asking colleagues, we were able to resolve almost everything. I think there are just a few times in the book where we have a little bracketed question mark, which signals to the reader, we're not sure about this word. But otherwise, we're able to resolve it. Um, and, Time just just uh, allowed that. One of the hardest things is when she does a name of a person or place that you're unfamiliar with, because then there's almost no context to rely on. You have to just sort of make out the letters, and she doesn't always actually form all of the letters in her writing. So, so it was a real challenge, definitely. Yes. Um, Janice uh, had, she wrote a biography of Cather that came out, um, I think, in 2003. And she had spent years collecting letters that she knew of that existed then. And she we had about that time about 15 to 1,800 letters. Um, and so she was really collecting those transcriptions for many years. We started working together 
um, on some letters research in about 2005 and, uh, and gathering things, doing research on the letters. Then when we finally got permission to do the book, we'd had this long period of research and gathering of information. Um, so we were able to quite intensely work for about a year or so to get the manuscript put together. Um, but that was enabled, of course, by a, a leave of absence I had for my job or a, a faculty development leave that was very important, and the fact that Janice is retired and we could just work together every day. Um, she lived in Texas, and she continues to live in Texas, and I was in Nebraska, and so God bless email. Um, we email each other many times a day and, and did almost all of our collaboration that way. Uh, um, so it was an intense period that followed years of research. <laughs> Yes. But the letters are all written by Willa to someone else. That's right. It, the, there would seem to be a huge process, process to collect all those letters from people that she would have written to. How did that that, that's right. So over the years, um, people, different people who received the letters did different things with them. Um, the ones that, most of them that are in the book, come from one of the 75 repositories that has Cather letters somewhere in their collection. Some of those repositories have one letter, two letters. Some, well, rarely, but one, like ours at the University of Nebraska, we have uh, hundreds of letters, near a 1,000. So, um, so it just really depends. And sometimes the people who receive the letters, like groups, like family groups, kept them all together and then donated them. Other times, they just kind of made their way through the market, um, the used book or, or manuscript market, and eventually got to a repository, or it's just any number of stories, as diverse as human beings are. And so, so we know of about 3,000 now. We believe there are many more out there we just haven't found yet because they're in somebody's private collection. Um, so someone doesn't know they have them in a box in an attic somewhere. And indeed, once the book came out and we got some nice publicity, a few people contacted us and let us know about individual letters they had in their family collections. So, so, so it's a difficult process, and I don't think I'll ever be confident that we have all of them, because you just never know what's out there. But one of the exciting things about that fact is, in the last 10 years or so, since I, I, about eight years since I worked at the library, we've had multiple donations of new materials that are very exciting, and so it's wonderful to be there when those discoveries are made. Ah, good question. Um, most of those haven't survived at all. She did keep, and we have now in our collections at the university, a lot of fan letters that were sent to her, which are very interesting. And our understanding from some comments she made is that um, she kept the ones that meant something to her. Um, that she got a whole lot of letters all the time, but, but kept the ones that somehow spoke to her. And she at one point in her life, had something like a, I had like a suitcase full of letters that traveled with her, as you know, that she used. So some of those have survived. Um, a few others here and there written to her have, have, for reasons I can't quite explain, survived, but most of them haven't. I don't think they were kept, is my guess, but I don't really know. The one exception to that is um, the pub letters with her publisher, the more business letters between her and her first publisher, Houghton Mifflin, and her second publisher, Alfred A. Knopf. Um, we have both sides of that correspondence because the office, the publisher's office, saved a copy of what they sent to her. And so the archives will have what was written to her and then what she wrote back. And that's, that's very, very useful. I wish we had that for everybody because it, it, it's so enlightening. Um, most of the time, we can, you can kind of get a sense. Uh, and, but occasionally, there's a reference to something the other person had written that's very mysterious. So, I think there's a question over here. As she grew older, what were her uh, reflections on Red Cloud and was it in the area of Nebraska. She was in New Hampshire in her late years, is that right? Yeah, yeah she, um, her permanent address for most of her adult life was New York, although she, most of those years she traveled to New Hampshire, um, later to Maine. She had an, <clears throat> a cottage on Grand Manan Island um, in, in Canada, or she came to Nebraska many times. She came here quite often and would stay for a few months um, until her parents died, really. A lot of her reflections, uh, I think there, there are two kinds of reflections she made in her later years on Nebraska. One was a lot of warmth on her memories of that place and her relationships. Um, families like the Minor family, um, and, and she kept in touch with multiple sisters from that family till the end of her life. Um, they, they, they remained very close to her, and she has some very poignant reflections on um, meeting them and spending her childhood with them. 
she also, I think, had a sense, and this was in her last years, which I think were troubled for her um, psychologically in some ways. She felt that some of the current members of the Red Cloud community didn't r like her and, and thought that she was out to get them, and, or you know, thought there was some kind of contentiousness that they were very critical of her, so she felt a little bit worried about them. In the years um, since her, her death, I think Red Cloud has um, mostly really embraced Cather's relationship. The Cather Foundation Red Cloud is a remarkable place that has preserved wonderful properties there. Um, they host a spring conference every year. The tours of those properties are, are a wonderful thing to do, and they're very active um, in making this book come uh, be, be possible and in supporting Cather research and teaching all over. So I think now the community um, it really is proud of Willa Cather, and, and I think her her work and her memories of that reflect that her time there was very important to her, too. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. I appreciate it.